Duncan Brands may go private. The company may get purchased for $9 billion. The stock price shot up yesterday because the purchase price was expected to be $106.50. If the company gets acquired and you hold shares of Duncan, then the private equity firm that acquires Duncan will have to pay you for the shares you own. As of right now, the market cap is $8.5 billion. But if the price gets driven up to $9 billion, $9.5 billion, $10 billion, the investors who currently own Duncan are in for a nice payday. Let's value this company to see whether it's a buy or a sell. Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott, and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day at 8 a.m. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Duncan Brand stock by analyzing their financial ratios and dissecting their financial statements so we can determine if the stock is a buy or a sell. Duncan Brands is a coffee and donut company. It was founded in 1950. The chain was acquired by Baskin Robbins in 1990. It subsequently acquired the Mr. Donut chain. Duncan and Baskin Robbins have been subsidiaries of Duncan Brands since 2004. With 12,900 locations in 42 countries, Duncan is one of the largest coffee shop and donut shop chains in the world. Its products include donuts, bagels, and coffee. They're a mid-cap company, 8.5 billion market cap. That's the value of the company according to the stock market. They're trading at 103.10 a share. And to get shares outstanding, its market cap divided by stock price gives you shares outstanding 82 million. Let's look at the financials. Free cash flow is how you value a company. You estimate the future free cash flows, then you discount that number back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. If a company has positive free cash flow, it makes it a lot easier for them to pay down debt, pay dividends, acquire other businesses, or invest back into their business to grow it. If a company has negative free cash flow, it might not be able to do any of those things unless it takes on more debt. So this company has positive and really consistent free cash flow each year, which looks great. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And they also have positive and pretty consistent net income each year. Revenue looks really good as well. It's the sales for the company and it starts at 829 million. It grows to 1.4 billion. So they're doing a good job growing their business. Their net margins look pretty good between 17% and 41%. Net profit margin is net income divided by revenue. It's how well you convert revenue into profit. In 2019, they converted 18% of their revenue into profit, which means 82% went towards expenses. Let's look at the financials to see more information on this company. The top line of the income statement is revenue. That was $1.4 billion in 2019. Below that is cost of revenue. That's how much money the company spent in order to generate this revenue. The difference between revenue and cost of revenue is gross profit. Below that is operating expenses. Operating expenses of $274 million. That's made up of $37 million of depreciation and $238 million of selling general and administration. Expenses that are part of SG&A are the rent for the corporate headquarters, also the payroll for support functions like marketing and accounting. So each year they have about $400 million of operating income. They do pay quite a bit in interest expenses. This is the interest they pay in their debt. They have a lot of debt, this company. But you want your operating income to be at least twice as large as your interest payments. And that is the case each year. It seems like they have a fairly lean business except for this large interest expense. This is the statement of cash flows and to calculate free cash flow, it's cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. And they don't have too much in CapEx each year, so they do have a good amount of free cash flow. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with net income, and then you add back the non-cash items from the income statement. Depreciation is usually the largest. And then you adjust for changes in working capital, which was pretty small, except for in 2016, it was a good amount. So in 2016, they had an inflow of $40 million in receivables. When you sell on credit, you're providing a product or service, but not receiving cash. But you will receive the cash in the future. So it looks like they sold on credit in the past, and the cash inflow came in in 2016. That's why receivables was an inflow of $40 million. So everything looks pretty good with their financials. Nothing really sticks out as a big red flag. Let's look at a capital structure. $3 billion of debt, negative $588 million of equity. That means their liabilities are greater than their assets when a company has negative equity. 
They pay 4.23% interest on their debt and a cost of debt is 3.21%. To get cost of debt, it's interest rate times one minus the effective tax rate. And they're 100% debt since they have negative equity. And their weighted average cost of capital is the same as their cost of debt, 3.21%. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 4.8 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $5.4 billion. We divide that by 82 million shares. We get a calculated stock price of 65.36. They're trading at 103.10, so they're trading at a 58% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply Wall Street is a little lower than me. They're at 61.08, so they're saying the stock is a little more overvalued. Let's see where the stock has been trading the past few years. When a market crashed in March, this stock came down, looks like below $40, but it's doing really well since the pandemic. This company has been doing phenomenal business during the pandemic. Lots of people have been coming through their drive through And you can see Duncan Brands performed better than the S&P since 2014. The company was paying a 27 cent dividend in 2015. They increase it little by little every year. They're up to 40 cents, so their dividend yield is 1.57%. To calculate dividend yield, it's annual dividend over stock price. Since the stock price has come up so much, the dividend yield has come down. As the price goes up, dividend yield goes down. And as the stock price goes down, the dividend yield goes up. This company IPO'd in 2011. If you invested $10,000 into this company when they IPO'd and you reinvested the dividends, you'd have $38,161 today. That's almost a 300% return. That's 15.5% annual average return. If you invested $10,000 and did not reinvest the dividends, you'd have $35,299, a return of 253%. The stock has been performing really well, so if you own it, you're probably pretty happy. Duncan also talks about the risks you as an investor will receive from investing in a company with such high leverage. Having such high debt does limit them in obtaining future debt when they want to take on new projects or acquire other businesses. Something we looked at earlier was the interest payment, so a significant amount of cash flow goes towards paying this debt each year. Also it mentions increase our cost of borrowing, meaning their interest rate may get higher if they continue taking on more debt. Another benefit when investing in a company like this, they receive lots of licensing revenue for other companies using their name. This may be difficult to forecast, but an increase in coffee prices could negatively affect this company's bottom line. If you're a really shrewd investor, you can forecast these types of things. There were some investors that saw the coronavirus in January in China. They shorted the American market because they saw it really affecting us and they made a boatload of money by shorting the market when a market crashed. Obviously, you have to put so many things together for these things to occur, but if you can figure it out, you can obviously make a lot of money. It's important to understand what you're investing in. You're not investing in a company that sells coffee and donuts. You're investing in a company that receives royalties from its franchisees. The revenue comes from five primary sources, royalties, advertising fees, a franchisee would pay a certain percentage of their revenue. Say for example, they paid 6%. Maybe 5% would go towards the royalty fee and 1% would go towards advertising fees. I personally own a franchise and I pay 12% of my revenue. 10% goes towards the royalty and 2% towards marketing. The company also receives rental income from its properties. The company doesn't sell coffee or donuts or any of its products. Those are done by third parties but they do receive some revenue from the sale of ice cream only in international markets. And as we spoke about earlier, they receive licensing fees. Another benefit of investing in Duncan is that it owns properties that it subleases to its franchisees. So if a franchisee is looking for a location, but they cannot find a good location in a shopping center, they may have to buy a storefront and the franchisee may not be able to purchase that storefront because it doesn't have enough funds. So what happens is Duncan buys the storefront and then leases it to the franchisee. So it owns that property. That's why they say McDonald's is the largest owner of land in the world because they own all their locations. 
And Duncan receives a significant amount of revenue from rental fees, $122 million. That's almost 10% of its revenue. When you invest in a franchisor, the most important thing is the franchisees are successful because that's where all the money comes from. If you're not familiar with franchising, it's just when a franchisor provides the franchisee with their name, their brand, and their business model. And they also give them a specified location to operate. So the franchisor provides the franchisee with as much support as they need to be successful. This is a breakdown on the revenue. 600 million, the most, comes from royalties. Then advertising fees, which is part of royalty payments. It's just called advertising. A bulk of their revenue comes from those two fees. They also receive a lot from rental income. There's also risk owning so many properties. What if a lot of the franchisees go bankrupt and there's a downturn in the real estate market and they have to sell those properties at a loss? Let's look at their financial ratios. The average PE in the market is 17.4, the median is 15.3. PE is stock price over earnings per share. And to calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. There are 35, so investors are paying $35 for $1 of earnings. The average price of sales is 4.6, the median is 2.0. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. To calculate sales per share, that's revenue over shares outstanding. They're at 6.2, so investors are paying $6.20 for $1 revenue. The average price to book is 4.7, the median is 2.3. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. To calculate book value per share, that's equity over shares outstanding. They're negative since they have negative equity. Equity is total assets minus total liabilities on the balance sheet. Average interest coverage ratio is 12.6. The median is 3.9. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. They're at 3.4, so they can cover their interest payments more than three times. The average ROE is 13%. The median is 12%. ROE is net income over equity. They're negative 41% since they have negative equity. The average current ratio is 1.8. The median is 1.3. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. They're at 1.6, so they can cover their current liabilities. Current assets are assets that can be liquidated into cash within 12 months. Examples are cash accounts, receivables, and inventory. Current liabilities are debts and payables that are due within 12 months. Examples are current debt and accounts payable. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies I've done videos on 13 restaurant companies and Duncan is right here in the middle. If Duncan has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. They're worse in PE, price to sales, and price to book. They're doing better than average in current ratio. Most in this industry have below one, so they cannot cover their current liabilities. Negative ROE, so they're worse. They're 100% debt, similar to Denny's, McDonald's, and Starbucks. They're smaller than average in market cap at 8.5 billion. Average is 24 billion because McDonald's is so high. And they do pay a higher than average dividend yield of 1.56%. Most companies don't pay a dividend in this industry. So to summarize, I do have them trading at a 58% premium. Their ratios look really bad, but their financials look good. Let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. I respond to all comments. Also, if you'd like to do a private Zoom session with me, receive a custom valuation, or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.